you've come to the right place. If you're looking to create, launch, and scale a high value online training program. I'm your guide, Chris Badgett. I'm the co-founder of Lifter LMS, the most powerful learning management system for WordPress. Stay to the end. I've got something special for you. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome back to another episode of LMS Cast. I'm joined by a special guest. His name is Jason Garcia. He's from SwiftSites.com. That's S-W-Y-F-T Sites.com. It's an all-in-one, done-for-you coaching website for the expert coaches out there. I love what Jason has done here, and I, I'm really excited to unpack, you know, kind of the story behind all this and how he sees the coaching industry. Welcome to the show, Jason. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, let's let's set some context here. First, just at a high level, what's the elevator pitch of Swift Sites? So Swift Sites is a way for a coach or a consultant to get everything they need in a website to get clients without having to do any of it themselves. And so the tech overwhelm, I mean, we're sold in the market of everything so easy, just push a button and everything's done for you. The, the, the truth of the matter is that rarely works, right? And even if you can throw up a, a template from Squarespace or something like that, that's not going to be a business machine that actually helps you generate business. And so that's really what Swift is about. All in one, truly done for you. So you can have a business machine at your back instead of a pretty brochure. I've always kind of aspired to this um, kind of value proposition or marketing slogan that is all the power of WordPress without the hassle. And you've es ex essentially executed on this for the coaching niche. Um, how do you, how do you provide all that without the hassle? Like what makes it, what makes the magic work so you can work with an expert that doesn't necessarily want to get too much in the weeds of the tech? So our business is two phases. The phase one is gathering their information from them. And so what we do is I have a software that we have, the Swift Sites platform. And in that platform, that is where people would enter all the information a designer needs. Is all that coming copy. through forms or is it like a folder or what is it? So that is, that's actually software I had developed. So I hired a oh, developer. Nice. And they bail out the entire platform. So yeah, it's an online application where everything is saved through that platform into a database that we can access. And so if you were my client, you would walk through a step-by-step -step process automated where you're giving me your colors, your fonts, your copy, your images, all within our software. Then you click So I button. know if I'm incomplete, like, okay, I haven't given him my, my headshot or something. That's, ex that's exactly right. We have, you have to check off what you've done. And we see on our end, our dashboard percentages. So we know where clients are in their process, how far they've come. Um, and when you're done giving us that information, you click a button that says, build my site. And that's the last you see of anything until your finished site is in your hands. And so we do everything after that. We build out the WordPress website. We set up their email marketing. We set up their scheduling. And when we're finished, we hand them the finished website and it's Elementor. So there is no back end that they have to go to. There's no code. It's just front facing changes if they want to tweak something. And we have tutorials on how to do that. So we really try to make it where give us your info. We'll do all the rest. If you want to change it, here are simple tutorials to do so. As a previous agency owner myself, I have to ask, like, what do you do if somebody has gotten into the content delivery phase and they just haven't given that they, they, you see that they have stopped their checklist of getting you what you need? What, how do you help them get across the finish line there? Right. So huge issue pre this, like this business model I did, I was a regular designer. And so my business would go on pause when clients would not send me their content. Like that's in the design yeah. world, that's the biggest thing. Right. So the way I built this business is there is no timeline or deadline. You take as long as you need to enter your information because we don't work until you're finished. And so that's how I got around that hurdle. Our business, once you sign on, we have nothing to do with you until you're done. You could take a month to do it. You could take a year to put in your information, but our team has nothing to do with you until you're ready to go. So it's up to you. Now we send out emails. We have a Facebook group. There's things where we can nudge them along, but in the end, we let them know it's up to you. If you want this website up and running, you know what you have to do, but we're not going to nag you every day to do it. Um, so that's how I got around a hurdle. And that's how we're able to scale because if someone takes a long time with their content, it doesn't affect us at all. And how does that work just on the money side? Is it like, 
if they already put some money up, so there's kind of skin in the game or, or if they already paid for the whole thing and, or how does that work just in terms of, um, you know, just the, on the money side, when do you get paid? Yep. So we upfront, you have to pay either in full or payment plan and the payment plan is um, monthly. So it's not tied to when they finish anything. Otherwise that'd be a really hard <laughs> yeah. business to run, right? We'd never be able to rely on cash flow. So yeah, if you were a client, you either pay in full on day one or you pay your first payment. And then we have payment plans where you pay every month to pay out your balance. That's awesome. And for uh, anybody, whether they're doing the website themselves or they're interested in working with a company like Swiss Sites, how, what's the average time it takes for an expert coach type person to kind of get that content to you? Is it like a month? Is it two months, two weeks, six months? What is it? So I wish there was an average and I, 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 we keep track and it's all over the place. Cause we have people who take a year. We have people who do it in an afternoon. Oh, wow. The average coach though, who can sit down and work at it. I'd say in about a week, they can finish. That's and cool. our build time is less than a week. So a client can come in through um, our doors, join on a Monday, their website can be up by the next week. I mean, that's the dream really, especially if somebody's really got their stuff together and then, you know, they, they've got their content ready and their colors and their logo and their brand and everything. What, right. um, they, yeah, they fly through it. Why the coaching niche or how did you end up here as of all the, of all the niches you could do for uh, yeah. a website service like this? How do you, how'd you pick coaching? So, um, I'll take you back a little bit. Um, my dad was two things. He was into marketing. So um, th that was very early age. I learned all about marketing and personal development. So I was reading Zig Ziglar, Tony Robbins, Earl Nightingale, Jim Rohn um, when I was 12 years old, right? So it started a long time ago in personal development. Then I went to college for marketing and um, right out of marketing, my dad had a website, my stepmom had a website, my brothers had websites. And this was 2001, so pretty early um, days. And I wanted to get in on it. Like everyone's got a website. And so I thought, what do I love to do? And personal development was still a thing I really was interested in. So I started motivation123.com. Back then you could get domain names like that, a, lot, <laughs> a little different than today. Um, and so that's where I really learned about how to build a website. So I did all HTML code and um, CSS wasn't invented yet. Um, and I really got hooked. So I dove in deep, built this website. And in just um, about a year or so, it went to the top of the search engines as the, so as the top ranked motivation website. And then I just kept going where we, we were top ranked for motivation, employee motivation, uh, motivational stories, motivational quotes. We had that covered. So I started getting millions of visitors. Um, I wrote books in motivation. So I, I'm an author on personal development. I did courses, coaching, consulting, the whole thing back then. Um, and then when I, I made my first million from that website, I was like, okay, I think I figured this out. And so I started helping other people as well. And what I realized was a lot of the people coming to me were coaches and consultants because they were people who sold their information, but because I had a focus in personal development, people who sell services and personal development, they're usually coaches um, or consultants. And so that's kind of how it came to be where when I was young, I was interested in it. And then it just kept getting deeper and deeper. And now it's been my whole life. Um, now, as that business ran, Motivation123 was great. It ran. I helped people. Then in 2016, I was diagnosed with cancer. So um, I, saying the word brings me back to that day in an instant in the kitchen. My wife's holding our four-month-old daughter. And I just see a message in uh, my little online portal that says, call me as soon as you get this. And I knew, you know, when a doctor says, call me immediately, not good news. And so that's when I got the news. Um, chemo radiation started within five days. So our world just flipped upside down overnight. Um, I had to walk away from what I was doing because I just couldn't going through everything I was going through. I couldn't run that business. Um, but the, the medical bills didn't stop. <laughs> Cancer is very expensive. Even if you have insurance, people who say you got insurance, what's the worry? It's very expensive, especially when you're not bringing any money in. Um, so I'm in the situation where I've got a four month old daughter, married house, like mortgage payment coming due. We're thinking about, do we have to sell the house now? Cause um, of medical bills. And I got an email out of the blue from Bill Simmons in South Carolina. And he asked me a simple question. Do you build websites? 
And I never, up to that point, never built a website for someone else. It was like my, I built them for me. Like I was the web guy for my own companies. But in that situation, uh, as a dad and a husband, I said what everyone would say. I said, of course we build websites. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it turns out he was a coach. And so that's really where I started to put all these pieces together that my background in personal development and marketing, the coach who knows how to coach, they know how to deliver their thing, but they don't know how to deliver it through a website. All of these pieces kind of came together. And I realized I've got 15 years of experience to solve this one problem for this one person. And that's, that's where it all came together for me. And so I started a new company at that point, it was Savvy Hippo and it was going to be, I, I, all the advice in the world is niche down, niche down. And I never listened. Um, motivation one, two, three, my market was human beings uh, between the ages of like five and 90. <laughs> and so that can work. But for this, I realized I really do want to be a specialist for these people. And so I cut out everyone else that we were working with and said, we only work with coaches and consultants. Um, and so that's kind of where that whole world started of the background led up to it and then Bill, that random email, it just turned, he was a coach. And I thought, you know what? I think this is it. And launched Savvy Hippo, um, built the software I, I talked to you about before a little bit about how to do this faster and scale. And then uh, we eventually rebranded the Swift sites and running the company we do today now where um, we've worked with over 225 coaches through our process with our, our platform, getting their sites um, up and running fast for them. So long story, but that's how it all came to coaches. <laughs> what, a, what an incredible story. Before we go deeper on coaching and coaches, um, I have to ask you, since you mentioned motivation, one, two, three, learning, um, you know, courses and consulting and coaching, there's like a learning component component. And if somebody is trying to teach somebody, motivation is important. So like what motivational it's, I'm sure it's a giant question, but what are some more counterintuitive or maybe misunderstood insights around motivation in a learning context between a teacher or coach and a student or client? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so what keeps, what keeps you motivated to do what needs to be done? Um, or from the learner side, I'm, I'm more thinking like, like, for the learner to like dig in and do the work to complete the course or to follow through on the coaching and the transformation and stuff to do their part. Right. What, okay. What, yeah. So what I would say for anyone who has clients and they have information, they need those clients to get through. I would say two things for me. One, make the endpoint very clear. Like, why are we doing this? Where are we going for Swift? We don't sell websites, right? We, we sell the business and life after Swift. Um, that's the key because that's what they want. They don't want a website, right? No one really wants a website, right? We want what the website can do for us. So I think having a very clear endpoint for your clients, this is what we're going for. This is why it's worth it. The other thing is to realize through that journey, there's going to be roadblocks. There's going to be bumps and be ready for those. Be ready for, I know you're running into this issue. This is common. Here's what you do to overcome it. Because when people are going through that learning cycle, it doesn't take much to have someone doubt, feel defeated and, and give up. And so what you want are along the way, you want benchmarks to keep that motivation going. You can't just set it once like Zig Ziglar said, motivation is like bathing. You can't do it once and expect it to <laughs> cover you, right? You have to keep doing it. And so um, that's what I would say, have a clear endpoint so you know where these people are going and then predict where they're gonna get stuck in that process, make it as easy as you can, but then have outreach, emails, texts, videos, anything you can do to be there to support them through any of those roadblocks that you know are coming along the way. How about the coach or the expert's motivation, just in terms of hitting a wall of burnout or maybe, you know, difficult clients or whatever that can cause them to maybe lose a little bit of motivation. How do you stay grounded and moving forward as a, as a expert, especially when you obviously care and have all this passion, but you're kind of burnout prone. Read your testimonials. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's, yep. That yeah. is my number one tip. Nothing can turn around, around a day, especially if you're working with a difficult client. Yeah. Um, first of all, you should have, you should have systems in place to try to vet out. Like you want to filter out everyone who could give, because as you and I know better than probably most people, clients make or break you, right? 
the, a bad client can ruin your, your life. <laughs> they just consume you. And so you want to have systems in place where you can make sure that you're only working with the, the top people that you want to work with, but get it to get those testimonials. Obviously that should be built into your service, but read your testimonials, have it on your website, of course, where people can see them, but you yourself as the person who's providing the service, nothing works better than seeing the difference you've made in people's lives, the reaction they've had to the work that you've done that can pull you out of almost anything. Um, I printed out testimonials when I was younger, I printed them out and put them all over my wall because I needed to remember if writing this book is so hard, like I'm just looking at the page. I have to remember someone somewhere in the world is going to read this and their life might be different. That makes it all worth it. So remembering who you're doing it for and then having kind of that visual of where you can read what people have been through with you. I think that really helps. Um, yeah. So there's tons you can do. I think that's one of my top ones is read those testimonials. Yeah. I like that. Like don't let one bad apple ruin the, the batch or whatever and, and revisit yep. those glory, the glory there. Um, on your website, this is at swiftsites.com, swift with a Y. Um, you have a resource called the five things your coaching website can't go without. What are a couple examples out of that resource that are essential for a website for a coach? Yep. So um, fundamentally, your, your website has to, you, you have to start looking at your website as a business machine. So the, the mindset shift is this is not a work of art which is what a lot of people look at their website as. This is like a painting I want to show off to my friends. Design. Yeah. Exactly. And what you want is a conversion machine if you're an entrepreneur. So with us, there's education that has to take place there. We're, a lot of coaches, it's like, it's like the mechanic who then runs the auto shop, right? They don't know how to, that, those are two different universes. And so a coach consultant has to realize they're entrepreneurs. And so- the first thing is you have to start looking at your website as a business machine. That's why tracking your numbers is important. That's why conversion optimization is important. It's not because it's going to improve that work of art. It's not because your neighbors are going to be more impressed. It's because it's going to help you actually build your business. 80% um, of coaches go out of business in three years. You need a machine that is built to help you solve that problem. Now, how do you do it? What are some of the fundamentals? First of all, it has to be able to book discovery calls or strategy sessions, right? Like quick and easy. The coach who says, ah, I, don't, I don't need that. I just have people email me. They have no idea how many people they're losing because people will not email you to set up a time to call. Um, the back and forth, there's friction. Having to email you, any step you put in front of a human being, there's going to be friction. They're not going to want to take it. So I would say, number one, that website has to be built and optimized to quickly and easily book a discovery call with you. Now, the fact is the majority of people coming to your website the first time are not going to book a call. The ask is too big, right? Either distraction or they're just not there yet. And so you also have to be offering the guide. So you mentioned the guide, that's what you need. You need a lead generator and then an email follow-up system. Um, the majority of coaches will get their clients on the back end after someone has entered their world, not normally on the first visit. So you want your website to be a machine that says, book a call if you're ready, but if you're not, here is our second objective, which is join my email list and I'll give you this great guide in exchange. Now you can follow up with them by email. So I would say that's like your one and two. You got to have scheduling built in. You have to have email marketing built in um, so you can do the follow up. How do you think about the hero area or like the top above the fold on a homepage? Like first impression besides the menu, what should we have like from an yep. imagery and copy standpoint, call to action, whatever, like what goes there? Perfect. So when it comes to coaching, you can have one of two images. You can have either an image of you if you're building more brand, because there is a celebrity factor there. If you get a professional photo shoot, always professional photo shoots. <laughs> when clients come to us and they say, oh, my son took a picture on his cell phone. Can I use this? <laughs> uh, no, you cannot. <laughs> um, so number one could be you if you have a professional shoot to build a cred credibility and authority, even celebrity. Um, if not, you show the happily ever after of your ideal client. So within three seconds, you want to connect emotionally with that visitor and show them what they're, what are you about and where can you take them? So for instance, if you're a marriage coach, you show a happy couple. If you're a health and fitness coach, you show someone who's happy, healthy, and fit. You show them their future so they can immediately connect with that image. As far as copy, we stay away from clever, like Donald Miller says, right? Like we stay away from clever. We want clarity. And so it's 
what I do, why I do it, here's what to do next, which is a button to book a call, or you can have a secondary button to get that lead generator to join the email list. But very clearly, this is what I do. So this is the big picture problem I solve or where I can help you get to. This is why I do it. Here are the benefits. Click below. We try and limit our headlines to two to three words if we can, and then our subhead to a single sentence or a few bullet points. Uh, but we minimize the copy there. We just wanted to say clearly within three seconds, I know what this person's about. I know what to do next. That's awesome. Now for the person that's not like red hot and ready to buy, if they're going to get the, the resource or exchange the email address for the guide or whatever, what do you use to, uh, for an advanced marketer, you know, they, they know how to connect all the dots there, but like, how do you make that part simple for somebody who's not a techie to get the email, deliver the thing and add them to the list and all that? What, what do you recommend there? So we actually, um, so I can answer that two ways. As far as our company, that's what we do. So everything is set up for a, a client. A client can visit a Swift site after they're done and people can visit their site, join their email list, get their giveaway, start getting an autoresponder and book a call. It's all done on day one. So it's not so, even just the website. You have the whole the, business machine there. <laughs> everything's done for them. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Coach cool. doesn't have to do anything. Once we hand the website to them, it is finished, ready to go. We've had clients who during their review phase of when they're reviewing their website, people are already booking calls in and setting up appointments. So there's nothing to do once we do our work. Um, now, if someone's just getting started on their own, you got to connect those dots, right? So you want to find an email marketing service provider and you want to integrate it into the website. And then you have to take your lead generator and upload it into WordPress, connect those dots with links. So there's a lot of um, pieces there, but that's what we do because we don't want coaches to have to worry about any of that. So we just hand it over and it works. The email marketing, we preload their email marketing service that we set up with three emails ready to go out. So the first three days, any new subscriber is gonna be start getting emails from them. Um, and then the client can add to that if they want. Um, but yeah, we do it all for them. But if, if you do it on your own, there's some, there's some steps that you gotta take um, to, to be able to connect and integrate an email marketing service into your WordPress website. That's awesome. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about identity in the sense that some people get a little wrapped up in words like um, I'm a course creator, I'm a coach, I'm a consultant. Like what makes a coach a coach in your view? And I know some coaches have like courses, some don't, but um, like really what is coaching and how is it different from consultant, course creator? Yeah. Like how do you, how do you really frame that in if somebody's like still trying to figure out where they are, what they want to become? Yep. So in the market of coaches right now, you have two, you have two groups, right? You have the diehard, like the, the original coaching is, and then they'll say, we, we do not offer advice. We do not answer questions. We ask the questions. We provide space for people. That's one realm of coaching. That's well, I haven't not heard this dichotomy before. So that's like the, the true, like, I'm going to pull the best out of you kind of thing. Right without any, I don't lead you there. I open the doors where you can walk through. So that's, okay. that's one area of coaching and that's fantastic. That's great. I, I applaud those coaches. I wish them the best. What we work with usually are coach consultants. They don't okay. call themselves coach consultants, but definition, that's what they are. They're people who do have programs and they have paths for you to follow. So they're there to both point the way and then support you as you go. So to me, when I think about the coaching industry, I think about experts who know how to get you somewhere and they're going to help you on your way. If you do talk to traditionalists, that's not what a coach does. That is not at all. That's what a consultant does. But for me, big picture, that's how I look at it. It's someone who knows something that you don't know yet, and they can share it with you to help you get where you want to go. So that includes people who do courses with support. So um, a lot of coaches want courses. I usually, the people we work with that courses support what they do. So I'm going to coach you and there's material for you to go through. We do differentiate between course creators though, where I just sell a course. They're passive, not, it's like passive. Yeah. Yep. And that's not who we work with. We do. There is some kind of interaction with your client um, for us, but yeah, those are the two worlds. The traditionalists who say you, you never tell someone anything. You always just ask questions, let them find the answer. There's people more like me who are, if I'm going to pay someone, I want them to tell me what works so I don't have to struggle to get there. Um, so that's how I differentiate. But most coaches that when they say I'm a coach, they're a coach consultant. They're a mixture. They're a hybrid of both. Yeah. Like personally, I, I'm kind of on your side with like, 
if I'm going to help somebody or if I'm asking for help, I'm looking for a guide a little bit. I want some guidance. I know I can, there's some stuff inside of me to be surfaced or in the client, but I think a helping hand, if when you've seen the patterns of what works before, right. it makes a lot of sense too. Right. Could you speak to like group coaching versus one-on-one coaching and like, should coaches offer both? I, I think there's some, some advice out there that you should always start with one-on-one maybe, but like, how do you, how do you see that kind of for people getting started? Where do they start for the best odds of success? Yep. So I would say uh, one-on-one, one-on-one is always your lowest hanging fruit. Also one-on-one is the easiest thing to sell. So if someone wants to do a course, write a book, anything like that, I, I say, if you want the easiest thing to sell, it's one-on-one coaching because nothing is as impactful or compelling as a human being saying, I'm going to be there with you. We're going to do this together. Group is fantastic for scale, but group is a different beast. You need to know how to manage a group of people, which is different than coaching a single person. So there's a different skill set where you have to have your coaching down if you're going to coach 20 or 30 people. If you're brand new, coaching one person can be overwhelming. And then if you open the door to 20 voices at once, it's a recipe for disaster in my mind. If you come from corporate where you're used, you're used to leading groups. If you come from a situation where the group dynamic is nothing new to you, I think you could probably get away with starting with group if you wanted to, depending on how you set it up, you have your course content where they can learn information and then say a group coaching call each week. I think those people can manage it. But a lot of these brand new coaches who are new to the whole world of it, I say, start with one-on-one, make sure you can help one person before you think you can help 10 at once. Um, So I'm a fan of the one-on-one. I just want people to start with easy successes, right? It's it's hard to launch a group program. It's harder to sell because you do lose something. That one-on-one connection with your coach often is is replaced by a group coaching call. So it's harder to sell. The value isn't as strong. So yeah, if if you were someone joining us and you were brand new, I'd say, Chris, I think your best bet is to find that one problem you are fantastic at solving, find the one person that needs it solved, and then work with that one person and get them a result. Then you know what you're doing. And it's going to help this coaching industry, which has a lot of people who don't know what they're doing. They don't know how to deliver a result, but they want to charge a ton of money because it sounds the internet lifestyle, right? That's a huge problem in coaching. And that's why it's gotten better. But early stages of coaching, people were like, this, this is, these are people who read a book yesterday and now they're charging me $10,000. Like their life is in shambles. They're trying to teach me. We've gotten a little bit better. Um, but that's what I think we need coaches who I can coach one-on-one. I know how to get you a result. Then I can work with more than one person at a time, but first make sure you know what you're doing. So you can deliver a really great service to someone. Also on the beginning of that journey, what makes somebody whether it's a consultant or maybe somebody's gone through a personal transformation themselves, like really ready to be a coach. Like what are they doing right before they're like, all right, coaching is what I'm going to do. Like, how does that transformation there? Who's a good fit for that? Who's not a good fit for that? How does that transformation happen? Often it, uh, to be honest, often it's certification. So you, you hear in the market because it's, you hear in the market, you don't need to be certified. You don't need any of that. You can just call yourself a coach. Yes, you can, right? That helps people sell things, right? If I say to you, you're worried about X, Y, and Z, guess what? Don't worry about any of it. Just buy my program, right? right. <laughs> I'm a fan of certifications that are that are reputable. They actually do a good job. It's not a weekend course you watch on Udemy or something like a 10-minute video, and now you can call, call yourself a coach. So I do think in-depth coach certification programs, which really teach you how to work with a human being to get them from here to there. I think that's usually the precursor to saying I'm a coach and I can do this. However, I was never certified. So I also think if you have the skills and you have a system and it's tested out in your life or in the lives of other people, I think then you can make the leap and call yourself a coach and charge for your services. But I don't think the people paying you should be the guinea pigs. I don't think that's where you should kind of figure out how to coach those people deserve the value that they're, they're paying for. And so it could be in your own life. You were in a toxic relationship. You did X, Y, and Z, and now you are out of it and you learned a process that helps that. I think then you can offer that as long as you know that it can correlate to other people. Um, or if you have helped other people unofficially, you've helped a friend who was struggling with a problem and you really dove in and helped them and 
and you have experience helping another person, I think there you could, you could hang your shingle and say, I'm a coach, but I do believe there has to be some kind of proof in the point. Like there has to be where you did it, you helped someone else do it, or you got certified to learn how to do it before you should be charging people money. Is there like a short list of certification places that you throw out there that you respect? Uh, so in the U S IPEC, IPEC is, is probably the top school. That's where what does that um, stand for. So IPEC and I can actually, let me, um, international something. Yeah. And I want to get, um, so IPEC and I'm just pulling up their site. Um, so I, cause I don't want to give any wrong information, but yeah, it's <laughs> the, um, Well, their site is just loaded of IPEC, IPEC, IPEC. They have so many different acronyms with IPEC, and that's why I, I <laughs> always <laughs> want to double check. Um, well, I'm in the LMS industry, so we say often there's too many TLAs, which is three letter and acronyms. <laughs> so it's uh, <laughs> oh, I love that. All good. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's it's professional excellence in coaching, and so um, I'm sure the I is international. Um, but IPEC is a, a it, it's up to a year long program where it is an in-depth program, um, remote the price tag. Um, yeah, I, I believe they, uh, they offer both remote and also on site and on the price tag, it, it's an in-depth program with a nice, it, it, the price tag it's not last cheap. I checked, it was, it was $10,000. Okay. The reason why when we get IPEC coaches, it's just a different experience is because these are serious coaches. These are people who really invested in this. Now you don't have to be an IPEC coach at all, right? You can still be a great coach. There's Erickson, which is another great one. Um, Tony Robbins offers a coach training certification, John Maxwell, um, Jack Canfield, um, Ziegler Corporation. So there are many great coaching schools. You just want to make sure you're working with one with a history, with successful graduates. There are a lot that come out and it's $5,000. And this is something we threw together last week because we learned about, uh, you know, how we could make money in the coaching market. <laughs> um, but yeah, the Erickson, IPEC, Ziegler, Tony Robbins, Jack Canfield, John Maxwell, those are some really good, uh, reputable schools that people go to. Do you see any patterns in like coach personality types? I know there's all kinds of different ones, but is there some common traits you see if somebody's maybe feeling the calling that might resonate with them? Yeah, it's really interesting when you talk to as many coaches as I have. I probably had I'll probably a thousand discussions with coaches one on one. What you find is a lot of people in HR. So a lot of people who come from the world of HR because they worked with people that that was their people. job, right? Yeah. People. Yep. You find a lot of people from ministry. So a lot of people um, who, again, they they were coaches in a different life. A lot of a lot of the people you find like, just like that, they were coaches in a different life. They're just now putting a name to it. So it's teachers, um, people who supervisors, managers who are in kind of that leadership role of coaching other people. Um, that's a lot of the people, because what they realize is I didn't like the nine to five structure. I didn't like the red tape. What I loved is working with the people. That's when I lit up. And so now I'm done doing what I don't want to do. Now I want to focus only on the part I loved, which is coaching. You also get people, a lot of people who've been through it themselves. So people who've been through traumatic experiences, when they come out on the other side, they want to share what they've learned to help other people through it. And so I get a lot of those two worlds where it's coach in a different life, or I've been through something. I figured out some really useful strategies to help me through it. And I know there are other people out there suffering. Um, in the end, it's service. It's really the people that we get to work with, it's the people who in the end, they want to help. They really truly do. Um, yes, they want to build a great business. Yes, they want the freedom, but it's less, it's less internet marketing lifestyle. Like that's what they're looking for and more. How can I get paid to spend my days helping other people? Um, so it's that service is just deep in their core. They're really passionate about giving back and serving. If we zoom out at a high level and look at the coaching industry, I know there's kind of like the, the big niches of like health, wealth, and relationships, but do you have any other kind of frameworks for looking at like all the different areas of coaching? Like what, what's, what are, where are some big areas? And I know there's like all these different niches, but what's the lay of the land out there? Yeah. And so that's not to just piggyback on what you said, but that is, those are the top three always, right? Um, money, relationships, and love. When you get a little deeper into it, 
what I find the two worlds are tangible, intangible. And so there are coaches who their work, you can touch and feel. It's a business coach who can say, we're going to do these concrete things. Um, it's a health and fitness coach who can show here are the tangible results. You're going to see different before things. and after before and after. Yeah. Then there is the spiritual life relationship where it's, it's, it's more intangible. Um, there it's more, so, it's, a, it's the difference between almost soft and hard skills where you can't point to it as much. So it's, it's a different universe of how you sell it, how you deliver it, how you can point to a positive result with it, how you market it. Um, but you're right. Before and after is a great way to put it. There's, there's that the coaching specialties where there is a before and after, and then there's the coaching specialties where it's more of life coaching, where you're uplifting people's lives. You're helping center them, ground them. You're helping give them, you know, hope you're helping them set goals. Um, so yeah, the top three are always going to be the top three money <laughs> and looking good, making money and finding love. Um, but when you get down to it, there's also, yeah, there are those differentiations where it's, there's more of the before and after coaches where you can point to results. And then there's the more of the softer skills where it's not as more intangible results. So we got a lot of on that side, the life coaching, the spiritual coaches, the mindset coaches, and then we get the business coaches, um, consultants, health and fitness coaches, career coaches. Um, those are two very different people because one, they're focused on the, the business. They realize this is a business. Life coaches, there's just a bit more education there usually when you're talking about it because sometimes they, they push against that I'm running a business. Unfortunately, if you want to succeed as a coach, you have to have both hats. You've got to know you're running a business, you're an entrepreneur and a coach. Um, so yeah, two different experiences with those two different worlds of coaches. I know there's a saying uh, in coaching called niche drama. So if somebody like actually lives in both worlds, let's say they were excellent in their role and professional and they want to, there's like this career coach opportunity, but they also are just in love with people and relationships. And they're like, I don't know which kind of coach to become. Have you, is there anything you can, you've seen that you could speak to? Like if somebody's like, I know I want to be a coach. I just can't choose. Cause there's all these different versions of things I'm into or what I'm passionate right. about. Yeah. I have a lot to say. Cause that is the, the number one and two issues. Well, I, there's three. What should my domain name be? Okay. <laughs> How do I write my words? And then the niche and the niche can stop people for years. That is the number one issue in coaching. And, okay. and part of it's just the human mind, right? Like the human mind does not like to close doors. Okay. The FOMO keeps us wanting to do everything always. But you have to so pick, what you I have would, to focus, yeah. right? You, I, I personally think you absolutely need to pick, but you only need to pick for a season. And I think What's that's the, the biggest thing that coaches have to realize. Yes, the season it's just this time in your life right now, it okay. does not have to be forever. So where coaches, I think, first of all, they, they, have to un, they have to learn the business basic, the basics of niching, which is what Taki Moore um, likes to say in coaching is the wider you throw that net, the bigger the holes are. The tighter your net, the smaller the holes. And so you catch the right people. If I'm gonna throw the net that covers the ocean, those holes are gonna be so wide, it's not gonna catch anybody. And so what you want to do as a coach to succeed is speak the language of your market. The only way you can really speak their language is by choosing a market. So if you want to work with people who, I mean, who are 15 and 50, very difficult, unless they have a shared problem and a shared experience, then you can do it. But normally niching is just so powerful. Everything changes. Your marketing gets easier. Your messaging gets better. You become a specialist. You can charge premium prices. On and on. Now, how do you do it? First, you have to realize it's not forever. Coaches are so scared about locking in and they think if I choose this today for the next 70 years, this is what I do. <laughs> no, this is not what you do. That would be number one. Number two, probably the, the work of it is you've got to make sure three things are in place. One, there's a market. Two, there's an ability. Three, there's passion. I put passion at the bottom. So many people put passion at the top. As long as you love it, that's all that matters. That is not all that matters. You could be passionate about people who have no money. It's very hard to succeed as a coach when your uh, target market can't pay for coaching. So what I usually tell coaches is start with everything your skill set can help you do. Then you narrow down by market. Where is there a proven market? Where are people actually already hiring coaches in this market? Where are they paying for courses? Where are they investing money? Where are there already groups that cater to this Facebook groups, LinkedIn groups, magazines, periodicals, books. 
you narrow down that way. Then you narrow down by ability. What can you actually do that's better than your average coach? Because everyone's a coach, right? You have to stand out. So what can you do better? What are you great at? And then finally, you narrow that list down. And then the last would be, what do you love to do? Who do you love to work with? And then you should get down to an area where there's a market, you're really good at it, and you love the people in it and want to work with them. Then when you realize this isn't forever, that, that helps you get to where you want to go to start. The other thing that I tell coaches is you cannot think your way there. And that's a big problem. People think if I just take the next 10 years and think about this, I'm going to get to this aha moment. You've got to get in there and do it. You've got to launch your coaching business and work with people and realize by doing it, this is what I like. This is what I don't like. I thought I like this, but when I do it, I, this is not my work. If you don't do it, you could take six months just trying to think about it, making pro con lists, but you just can't think your way there. You've, you've got to do it. You got to boots on the ground, get in there and actually do the coaching. Of course, you don't just want to say, I coach everyone on everything. You want to still pick those areas that have a market. There's demand ability. Um, but I really do think if you're just trying to think your way there in your head, it's going to be, you're going to drive yourself crazy. So get into it and then you can figure it out. You mentioned it. So we'll bring it up is the domain name. Should a coach <laughs> be uh, their name.com or should it be like the name of their program or their niche or whatever.com? What do you recommend? Their name.com every single time. Okay. Um, Why for a few that? reasons. Yep. So motivation one, two, three. Yeah. It did not matter where I wanted to go. I had to stick with motivation. Other, it wouldn't make sense because people put a lot of stock into the name they read. If it's your name, they have zero attachment or meaning to it. So if I went to, for instance, jasongracia.com, no one has any idea what this is about. And so they're open, but I just had a client uh, a few weeks ago and her thing was dazzlingrita.com. Now to her, dazzling means whatever it means. She can't control though what dazzling means to her market. And so she could be losing people because they might think, oh, dazzling, what is this like jazz hands? I don't need that kind of coaching. And so you gotta be careful. If you choose a descriptive name, people can be turned off because of their association with it. The other thing is if you change direction with your name, nothing changes, logo stays color scheme, your website, your domain, everything can stay because you can go in any direction and it gives you instant credibility and authority. If it is your name as the website, you are all automatically granted a certain level of authority. So that is my vote always, first name or first name coaching if that's taken or a nonsense name like Savvy Hippo. That also gave me freedom because after cancer, I didn't know what I was gonna do. So I wanted a name. And so Savvy Hippo gave me the freedom to do whatever I wanted because it didn't mean anything. I filled it with meaning. The tougher names is like Swift sites. Before I knew what I, do, I was doing, Swift sites is too specific. People have an idea of what these people do and what they mean. I couldn't do that early in my career because I didn't know what I wanted to do. So for coaches, they always bring it up. I always say, get your name as fast as you can and don't worry about it a, another second and just move forward because this will trip them up for months. Um, so that's my take. Other people have different takes, but I've, I've seen the question hurt people so many times that I just say, pick your name and next let's, let's, let's keep moving forward. The third thing you mentioned was words. I think, what did that, what would you mean by that? There was the nitpicking the niche, the domain name. And then the third one was words. I think you copywriting. Said? Oh, copywriting. All right, yeah. cool. So speak Copy. to that. I mean, yeah, I, I'm a marketer. I spent a lot of time learning that. And I know that is not a skill that everybody has. And it takes a while to develop that. So like, yep. how does it, what, what's a coach to do? What's a coach to do? Yeah. It's copywriting is the most important piece of a high converting website. And it's the hardest piece by far. Hardly anyone understands copy without learning copy. So the way we solve it is we have in our platform, we, here's what I did. I took, I realized this was an issue and we just, we have to solve this. So I of course taught them. So in our platform, we go through every section of every page and I say, this is what you should write. This is how you should write it. Here's examples of what other people have written. But then we got to the point where we just had to write it for them. And so I took six months and I wrote entire coaching websites from 10 different specialties, life coach, life purpose coach, business coach, career coach, and they can click a button in our software and it pre-fills all their pages with my copy. So they're more then, just editing, not inventing. All their, that's exactly it. So what I tell them is you should still edit. It has to match your voice, but as far as how do I write this? What do I write? How much do I write? That's all taken care of for you. See what I wrote for you from the angle of a career coach, for instance, and now tweak it so it makes sense for you. But editing and tweaking, we have our clients do, not copywriting. 
if they don't work with us, I usually think you need to hire a copywriter because if you don't have the right words, none, it, it doesn't matter. No one's going to convert and it's a waste of money to invest in a website that doesn't convert for you. So copy is key. We do it for them. If you don't have that, hire a copywriter who can go through your words with you. Is there any just quick copywriting slash strategy ideas you have for somebody who is looking to differentiate in the market? And yes. um, yeah, they, and maybe they're struggling with a little imposter syndrome, but if they could at least figure out like, okay, well, this is my spot in the market and say it well, I think that helps overcome that. Like what could, what's, a, what's a coach to do to kind of differentiate when they feel like they're in a crowded market? Yeah, which is everyone is, right? So the number, I'll say two things to that. First, copy, realize you're never selling coaching. It's basic, right? Basic copy 101, but you are not selling. You're not selling the plane. You're selling the vacation. So many coaches speak coaching on their website. They just do coach speak and no one cares. They ignore it and they leave. You've I just want to give sell. a quick example. I, I, I got some coaching from a guy who went through Taki Moore's program and he, he helps software entrepreneurs at my stage scale. So, and that's exactly what happened. I went in there to scale my company, not necessarily get coaching, but that's what it was, right? Exactly. That's exactly right. You have to sell what people are buying. They are not buying coaching. And that hurts coaches. They, because a lot of coaches feel like it's me. It's not you. You have nothing to do with what they're after. They want the better life, the better body, the better marriage. That's what you sell. So when it comes to copy, you, you speak to their problems and their dreams, right? Pain and pleasure, not what you do. We don't sell websites. We don't speak page optimization. We don't speak how like to speed up the load. No one cares about that, really. They want clients. They want to change lives. So that would be the, the copy approach. Make sure that you're selling to the pain and the pleasure. As far as getting out of the crowded market, you need to brand everything you can. Don't say I'm a life coach. Say I'm the creator of the XYZ coaching program. Don't say that I offer a free session. Say that I offer the XYZ strategy call. So the more that you can name and brand what you do, you pluck yourself right out of the ocean and people realize I can't get this anywhere because this is the only place where I can find this program that does it this way. That's really what you want to do. So you, you don't want to tell people you're a coach. You don't want to tell people that you do coaching. What you can say is I have this program and here's what we help you do. So if you're, if you want to scale your software business, I wouldn't say ah, I'm a coach. I would say you got a software business that you want to scale. You're exactly the people I help. And here's how I do it. That's awesome. Um, just to land this plane here and, and Jason, thank you. You've been a treasure tro trove of information and good ideas here. Um, you mentioned, uh, that, you know, having the ability, having a market and having passion is important. What makes you so passionate about the coaching industry or, or working with coaches? This is a great wrap up question. Cause it really gets to the core of like why I do what I do. And I, I remember where I was in my house. Um, dealing with cancer, realizing that it's always been me, like me, me, me. I wrote the books. I created the courses. I did the coaching. I had my face everywhere. And what I realized was that made me feel good at first being that like center of the attention. But if I wanted to help as many people as possible, I needed to help the helpers. So I realized I want to be a springboard. There's nothing wrong with being a personal brand at all. It, it's fantastic if you do it right with integrity. But what I realized was if I really want to reach more people, if I could be a springboard to coaches, then I would play a small part in the success that the coach has with all of their clients. So instead of working with, say, 10 people, I could work with 10 coaches who then go on to work with 100 people. Um, and that's really spoke to me at that moment in my life. It still does where if I can help a coach figure this part of their business out, I then play a tiny role in all the people they go on to help. And so I just love that ripple effect of making a bigger difference with the time I have. Because after cancer, you realize in a day, everything changes and there's no guarantees. And so I wanted to make a, as big of an impact as I could, as quickly as I could. And so I, I became the springboard for coaches who want to change lives. Um, that's where my passion comes from and keeps me going. Wow, that's awesome. That's Jason Garcia. You can find him at swiftsites.com. That's S-W-Y-F-T sites.com. Also check out his guide on the website, the five things your coaching websites, your website can't go without. Um, Jason, thanks for coming on the show. Any final words for the people? I would say anyone who is thinking about doing anything like this in our world, do it. It, it is so worth the experience. And if you have something in you that you think can be shared and improve the lives of others, 
I can just tell you through personal experience, and I'm sure you can too, it is so worth the effort. It is so worth the risk because the worst thing is to have this in you and then just think about it until there's no chance. You got to go for it. So that's what I always want to say at the end of these, uh, these uh, interviews. Is if you're on the fence, you can figure everything out, right? All of the, the fears you have, there is a way through. People have done it, but you got to take that first step. And so whatever ideas in your head, give it legs because it, it's worth it. And you're, you have no idea where it can take you. And so it's always worth it to take that risk and to, to bring life to the ideas that are in your head. Awesome, Jason. Thanks so much. We really appreciate it. Ah, thank you so much. Chris, it was great being here. And that's a wrap for this episode of LMS Cast. Did you enjoy that episode? Tell your friends and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. And I've got a gift for you over at lifterlms.com forward slash gift. Go to lifterlms.com forward slash gift. Keep learning, keep taking action, and I'll see you in the next episode.